I was intrigued by this whole process because um, the 2040 climate targets is a policy area that really matters for us. And so to understand fully different perspectives on this topic, I think this whole workshop was a series of workshops were very a good way of hearing firsthand how different organisations think about it, to exchange on where we can align on and where um, there might be barriers we need to overcome. Carbon dioxide removal is so it's just so important to getting us to our net zero targets and net negative and beyond. And I think that when you're not in this space um, and not familiar with uh, the extent of climate policies, we are, you often don't, I think there's a lot of misinformation and miscommunication and lack of education out there. And I think really getting clear on what would be needed and it's a new area and you know we're still making up the policy as we go and looking at the policy design it's so important to actually just get together and try and be clear on that and really push forward new ideas as they come along is still in the EU a rather controversial um, policy topic and we thought this the controversial nature of this topic merited taking a somewhat different approach to just a regular advocacy project as Carbon Market Watch um, might might do it, given that we saw quite a wide uh, gulf or a, um, a, a polarization in opinions as to where carbon removals should feature in EU policy and how they should be supported. But in other words, go beyond the usual work of building alliances with fairly like-minded um, people to actually getting people together in a room who seemingly disagree, who have starting positions that are, are somewhat um, apart. First of all, I think the topic of, or the subject is important, carbon removals and how they can be incentivized in a way uh, which is sustainable. But then on the other hand, also the approach, I think it, the idea of co-creation is, is important because it makes use of this whole intelligence and uh, getting uh, viewpoints from different angles. And I at least noticed a lot of uh, aspects which I haven't heard before. So I learned as well uh, very much from the process. I can say the beauty of a co-creative process is that people will actually identify with the process, with the topic and with the results. They will in the process, um, it might be a bit more intense, it might be a bit more uh, dramatic at times, maybe even people not fighting, but really wanting their voice to be heard. But this in the end will mean that people care about it the process and the results, and they will go to greater measures to make sure that the results are heard and something will happen with them because they helped co-develop it. I wanted to test some of my ideas about, if you like, overturning the way we do climate policy and rejecting the offsetting model for carbon removal. And the cooldown process uh, offered a really good opportunity to have um, a diverse range of people thinking about those issues and offering insights into different ways of approaching carbon removal. The idea of co-creation I think is actually essential in this space. It's um, a method that allows for a great diversity of inclusion but brings people together without their or without all their preconceptions so we can have um, non-governmental organizations we can have representatives of industry and industry associations in the room having a constructive conversation one of the reasons we that works is because the process recognizes incompleteness it recognizes that we're not going to resolve everything all at the same time and that opens up the possibility for thinking in new ways, even in spaces that are really quite politically contentious. The, the way in which we've gone about trying to coalesce around some principles and specific recommendations on the, on the European climate law um, have been challenging at times, um, partially because I think at one point we tried to sort of go into specific amendments before we'd agreed on more general principles. Um, but once we kind of got a sense of that, 
being a requirement um, and we started talking about the principles and everything um, we basically made the work a lot easier we were I guess given a bit more time to flesh out some of these principles to try and come up with some reasonable sort of compromises in a way of what these principles should be um, and all rounds that that process has been has been very interesting you're you're asking a lot of people in the workshops to participate in creating text um, and giving the support of a group who can put a bit more time into that text between the meetings I think is very useful in, in terms of making the process work. That's really the, the big potential for people to identify with it, um, to identify so much that they want the result to be as good as possible, um, which might make the process a bit harder, but also more fruitful. When things are done in silos, you, you really run into trouble. And so bringing these groups together for co-creation not only lets you um, interact with different views out there, but it also allows you to talk it out and actually reach some consensus, even if it's not perfect. And I think that um, in trying to come together and push for policy change and progress, you need to have almost a, a united front and it's, it's ideal for doing that. Being able to come here um, as a member of your institution, but also as an individual, it really gave you the space to explore ideas uh, and talk to groups and representatives from entities that you wouldn't ordinarily be confronted with in, in one space. And I learned so much, and I think a lot of other people did as well. So being able to bring these together and actually see right in front of you progress being made. You know, there was at the end of our sessions, there was a lot of pink text uh, on the slides. So which meant that we'd actually all contributed. You know, having a session in the morning and writing, you know, having one of your suggestions written on the board um, and having it discussed and then coming back at the end of the day when every group presented and seeing that suggestion was still there or that it had been developed further or that it had been taken off the board entirely. So you can kind of see uh, and track the progress of you know the suggestions you've made and where they've ended up and how they've reached consensus. You can see already a sign of progress is looking back at the first session and seeing how much it's changed since then. I feel like we got to a great level of detail actually and um, to see those first signs of people taking ownership of the of the ideas um, so not us as facilitators for example mentioning something but um, participants really starting to yeah take ownership of the ideas and starting to talk about a we a collective overcoming differences between different groups um, i think it was a good a great ride actually I actually was very pleasantly surprised about how much we could align on. So having breakout groups where you can really dive into specific topics, um, I thought it was structured in a way where it just promoted just thinking and promoted discussion and deliberation. And by having sort of this combined voice, and if we are able to align, I think that can be very powerful in changing EU policy. The effort to uh, revise the climate law um, because that was quite challenging, uh, in the first place we had a huge brainstorming and then to reduce it again. And I was a bit skeptical on the results uh, of uh, the, um, for, for this day, this the last the final workshop. But I think uh, it was prepared well and I'm optimistic that it helps the discussion. It was important also to learn the ex experience. So the co-creation is something which can be used for other uh, policy areas or policy discussions or upcoming issues. And so uh, I'm looking forward to make use of that, that approach myself in, in my work. It has been around for a while and, and it's been used in a couple of different settings. But in policy design, it is actually pretty much an innovation and there's not really a playbook yet on how to do this. There's been a lot of experiments going around and uh, I have to say Carbon Market Watch was really courageous to try this out and to embark on this journey with us. They also gave us a lot of trust. Um, I do believe it paid off and the innovation really worked. The climate challenge coincides with 
the challenge also to go about policy making differently and uh, in, in particular at EU level get a bit away from uh, controversial uh, interest based haggling over policy um, outcomes. I think it can be something really great if we are able to come up with final documents, so a final revised climate law and also a final um, policy recommendation so we can take it to EU policy makers and especially at such a critical time as I mean, this year, as the EU elections, the next five years are going to be critical for scaling up carbon removals. And so if we can all come together to policymakers saying this is what NGOs, this is what industry, this is what academia think is necessary, then I think that could be really, that could be very powerful um, and hopefully policymakers will listen. I think a lot of participants in these workshops will be going back, the academics for example, I think a lot of them will be going back and trying to explore them a bit further, um, try to flesh them out. Um, us as, as sort of NGOs um, and, and on the advocacy side of things, um, you know, our job now will be to see how we can operationalize those into policy recommendations, not just in the climate law, um, because that's you know, just one of the many laws that need to be amended. Almost all participants had such high hopes for the afterlife. Um, so that gives me a lot of hope as well, because if the participants had been like, Ugh, all right, this was great, bye bye, see you. Um, yeah, I think I would have felt differently about the project as well. But seeing that participants are excited about the ideas, want for them to be presented on a scale as big as possible um, and want to um, yeah, want to be part of the afterlife also, not stopping their collaboration here, but actually wanting to be part of the further pro process. That's the best sign and that makes me really hopeful. The, the results have shown us that we can move a long way towards a better carbon removal policy for the EU. It's revealed where there are the most challenging um, areas of difference around particularly finance for carbon removal but I think it's also given us some avenues where we can work together collectively to overcome some of those differences even if we only get a fraction of what is on the table now through in the policy process I think that will be a good outcome um, for those of us involved reach out to policymakers, to reach out to the Commission, show them what we have come together, like what we have formulated, and begin sort of beginning to have that dialogue with policymakers um, and to really make ensure that we have separate carbon removals targets from emissions reductions, and then we have an established permanent removal target, which is truly the foundation of scaling up the sector. I think this process um gives a foundation to reach out perhaps to a wider group of people um, around the coming negotiation of the climate law but most importantly in terms of trying to establish a broader coalition for CDR policy in the EU and for the EU therefore to be offering um, something of a leadership role globally the, the US is taking one approach to carbon removal policy, which is very much market oriented, very internally focused. And in the long term, even though it'd be very controversial, the understanding the role that carbon removal has in the interests of not only future generations, but also the vulnerable around the world, makes it a very international topic that a good policy from the EU could be particularly helpful. Removals are expensive, they're scarce, but they're also unavoidable. Um, and we need to get involved as environmentalists to make sure that we get it right. If we don't get it right, then there's quite a lot of dangers uh, that are in store for us. Um, we might of undermine emission reduction. Along with steep emissions reductions, we need carbon removals. So we need to be scaling up permanent carbon removals if we want to have sustainable net zero. And the 2040 target is a central piece here. Um, by having an established target in EU legislation, we're really setting the, the signal needed to scale up the sector. The uh, ingoing controversy is, of course, over how big a role removals can play and um, 
most ardent climate advocates are of course worried that renewables will be a distraction from emission reductions, but it's becoming increasingly accepted carbon removals will be necessary if we're supposed to save the, the planet. As a collective on this planet have pretty much or possibly already exhausted our carbon budget and um, the interests of many, many people in the future in a stable climate, the interests of many people in the present in recovering from the disruption that their climates face already rest in us being able to sustainably and fairly remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. The problem is that if we don't respect those limits of sustainability and justice, we will probably make matters worse for many of those people. So it's incredibly important and very delicate issue to deal with.